Hello, humans. Let me ask you a little question. Josh here, by the way. Josh Sepps. Do you ever feel that sometimes there's a little bit too much politics in the world and sometimes we talk about the same things a little bit too much? Because I know I have gotten to feeling that way. So, here's a special episode. Something a little bit different. Something we've been keeping in the bag of tricks for you, not knowing when to pull out. We thought, gosh darn it, we thought to ourselves, why not pull it out this week? I'm in Australia. It's summer. It's sunny. I'm by the beach. I don't want to talk about Trump. I don't want to talk about political correctness or identity politics. What I do want to do is listen in to a conversation I had all the way back in August in Los Angeles with one of the great American comics. This is a slightly wonky conversation about comedy, about American broadcasting, about Dave Letterman, about late night television. It really has bugger all to do with a lot of the things we've been talking about in recent months, but I think that's ref refreshing, and I hope that you shall too. Andy Kindler is a bit of a legend, a bit of a comics comic, they would call him. He hosts, uh, at Montreal's Just for Last Festival each year, he hosts an annual State of the Industry Address, which has become iconic, where he roasts people like Dan Cook and Louis C.K. and Chelsea Handler and Jay Leno. Um, he, you may have seen him on Everybody Loves Raymond. Uh, he was a contributor on The Daily Show. He's performed on HBO. Uh, he was a judge on Last Comic Standing. But really, it's his, it's his affiliation and his long relationship with Dave Letterman over Letterman's career that, uh, that first brought him to my attention, made him something of a, of a hero of mine when I was little, and has cemented his role in the, in the comedy pantheon among comedy nerds. So I, I say this simply so that if you don't know who he is, uh, you don't need to feel bad, but uh, you ought to know now. Hope you enjoy the conversation. We'll be back with regular, more regular programming next week. Also, if you're in Australia, well, specifically Sydney, come to the live show, which is next Sunday, the 18th, at the Chasers Theatre, Giant Dwarf. You can get tickets at giantdwarf.com.au and follow the links to We The People Live. There's also a Facebook page about it, or just follow us on Twitter at WTP underscore live. That's going to be a big show, and all the rest of you will obviously be able to consume the audio of that within the next two weeks. Enjoy the conversation. Welcome to We The People Live, I'm Josh Sepps, you can follow me at Josh Sepps, or the show at WTP underscore live, which you're probably already doing, because you know how to find the show, because you're listening to it right now. Today, a special one-on-one, -on -one with one of my favourite comics when I was growing up. I hope that doesn't make you feel old, Andy. Feel, it does make you feel old, but it's also, it's realistic. It is realistic. Uh, Andy Kindler is has appeared on he appeared on Letterman, I, I believe, more times than any other comic in the history of the universe, probably. No, I wouldn't say that. Well, well, yeah, just roll with it. You could say just lie. Well, I did feel pieces for him. Yeah, and you so. did feel pieces. He loved. I mean, that was the first time I remember you was seeing just the sheer affection that he had for you. Every time he would have you on the show, he got such a kick out of. Uh, you know, you'd do a set, and then you'd come and sit down with oh, him, and well, then you, then you were doing field pieces for him. Yeah. So I, because Letterman was such an influential person in my uh, my creative career when I was ten. Do you right. have a creative career when you're a child? I, don't know. I think you do. I wanted to be a, a Beatle when I was five or six. Is that was that it? Yeah. Well, I the Beatles came. Uh, I remember when they. Oh, I shouldn't say this. I remember <laughs> when Paul Revere came to town. In his later years. Uh, so I remember watching them on TV and then they're taking like a tennis racket and trying to be a guitarist. Which, so, one, yeah. which one would you have wanted to be? All of the, Well, I don't know. When I went to the movie, I actually saw Hard Day's Night in the movie theater. And they, and they booed John because he was married. John was married briefly to Cynthia, Wait, to Cynthia was, Lennon. Was it women who wanted to have sex with him who were booing him? Or was it yeah, men well, who yeah, disapproved of his... No, no, it was women. Women right. booing that he was married. But not really. Mm -hmm. It was everyone was screaming. I wasn't screaming, but everyone else was. No, <laughs> so they weren't screaming. I'm you're just claiming that it was the marriage. But actually, yeah. I mean, I think it was fairly common that wherever the Beatles went, they, oh. know, they, got, they got screamed at. That's married, or, married or nay. Yes. Well, I think even in one of the scenes in A Hard Day's Night is a real scene. Of them running oh, down really? the street. That's why being I'm chased. Being chased, yeah. Um, Which has never happened to me, as we know. <laughs> <laughs> were you if, I, if someone's chased me, I assume I'm going to be stampeded. <laughs> were you ever chased or uh, recognized when you were exiting the uh, the Ed Sullivan Theater in uh, in New York City? No, but I've been. It was Just absolutely where was exactly. Uh, um, and by the way, that was like I mean, I can't talk about it without sounding, I don't know, overly sentimental. But that was a dream come true. But I'd be up in the in the dressing rooms. 
Because I think uh, John Lennon, he's like, went from the fourth floor dressing room up to the fifth floor dressing room. I love that room. we're still on the Beatles. I've yeah. tried to pivot away back to Lennon. And, uh, and we've yeah. we'll gone straight back to John John. And then, and then still a Mirror. There's a little picture of Stiller and Mirror up in the... Uh, I don't know who's Stiller uh, and Mirror. Uh, Jerry Stiller and... Uh, oh, right, of course. Ben Stiller's parents, who were a great comedy double act back in the day. We have now exited... The conversation about the Beatles, and if you needed to fast forward to this point, well, then you couldn't fast forward to this. You could. You wouldn't know. You wouldn't know that it had happened. Yeah, and I'm a strong listen- opener. But, <laughs> but our audience listens at least seven to eight times to each episode. So, okay. Whereas for the people who are listening back for the fifth, sixth, seventh time, yeah, they know exactly when but, to skip skip to. And do you open up with? And don't forget to go back to my. You have various products that you sell. Sure. You getting one of them is uh, is is. Glasses. Oh. A glass here on the table, which right. uh, I just brought out for you to drink Sprite from. Yeah. Oh, is this you? And which is people this should, yours? Which people should uh, cons- consume things from rather than pouring Sprite into their hands and then sipping it like they're in the desert. Mm. That was my plug. That's oh. the extent of my sponsorship like right now, Andy Kindler. We're both which, the same. Which of the Beatles? Uh, so I asked you. I asked you which you would be, but which was the best? Because and I asked this because I had a Beatles conversation recently with somebody, and I was making the point that of all of the great Beatles songs, the one that just spins on my head more often than any other is uh, what's the one that Ringo did about? Uh, <laughs> I can't believe that, I can't even remember the uh, song now about not Octopus's Garden. The one but, where he don't sings it out of tune. Yeah, well, the guy comes Ooh, in, there, no. has a gun, and then he shoot, there's a shoot, there's a shootout at the end. Oh, uh, Rocky, Rocky Raccoon. Rocky Raccoon. That's not your favorite yeah. Beatles song. Yeah. Well, then you know you like the Beatles, obviously. <laughs> no, my favorite. It's Beatles. just such a silly song. It is silly. I it, don't, doesn't, yeah. it doesn't make any sense. Right. It doesn't really cohere. It doesn't. It's like someone. It's like he just threw it together, and because he was stoned one afternoon, and he decided to have some fun. It's the White Album, I believe. Sure. That song and they had a lot of maybe extra songs in the album. Although when I was a kid, I loved every Beatles song. My favorite was John because uh, he was the funniest, and I also used to love that book that he wrote in his own right, R I T E. Okay. No, W R I T E. W R I T E. Yeah, so that's actually the first time I ever saw like word wordplay pun type stuff. Was John Lennon's book. in his own right? There you go. I'm very old. <laughs> We, we only had, like, three books in the entire country when I started. There was the we Bible. We had encyclopedias. There was the Bible, the Encyclopedia Bible. Britannica, and In My Own Right. Right. Uh, and where did you start out doing comedy? Where, where, what was your I'm from New York City, Genesis? but I, uh, I'm from Queens, and, uh, but right after college, I went to college upstate New York, and I was an English literature major, and then I was a musician. I, I played guitar, and uh, that's what I thought I wanted to be, because hmm. I was of the generation where you know the i was more musically influenced it's just like i i came from the where you would want to be if you wanted to perform you probably wanted to be a rock and roller when i was so so i moved out to la after college to be a musician and i struggled for many years some people would say i'm still struggling but then <laughs> as a I, musician yes well yeah but i mean and then i stumbled into comedy a friend of mine i was i had all kinds of day jobs i sold stereos i sold door to door how old are you at this point how, what's that? How oh, old are you I, during I, that period? I came out uh, uh, when I was 21 years old. I drove cross country like a, it was a classic. Well, planes hadn't been invented yet. So they had not been invented. Didn't have an option. You and the jalopy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and uh, I came out and uh, in a Ford Country Scar station wagon mm-hmm. with with a uh, with an ex girlfriend who just contacted me on Facebook. Was she an ex girlfriend at the time? That was the problem. Was that we weren't getting along, mm. and it was a terrible breakup that lasted. The cross country trip, mm-hmm. and then a couple of months in LA, and then she and then she went back. Just a long there. drifting apart, just a gradual yes. peeling off of the band aid, just oozing away from each other in a soul destroying dance of death. And I was even more. Uh, well, I don't know why people would assume that I would be uh, insecure, but I was so insecure. We had a rule that I couldn't say uh, talk to her until after she had coffee in the morning. I have a rule. I have that that rule. That's a good rule. I think that's a fair enough rule. <laughs> right, but that's something that adults might yeah, agree with. put that up there so that it doesn't make a noise. Oh, well, well you know what I'll do it? Oh. I'm going to put it in here I'm like he was trying to. He, he, he's, Andy is enjoying a delicious, cold, refreshing can of Sprite. I should have just made Sprite the sponsor. Can someone, can someone give Sprite a call and uh, see if we can get some sponsorship for this episode? So I kindly got that from the mini bar. The staff is, and that's very, and I appreciate it because I know it's like $8. Actually, it's free here. That's why I offered it to you. 
Is that true? That's true, because you pay $750,000 for a room <laughs> I saw what the prices were. <laughs> we're, we're at a fancy hotel in, uh, in West Hollywood. I saw. I was like, oh, my God. You so are, the smallest I consolation. I thought, uh, I thought I was doing well. I got... <laughs> Sure, I'm doing well, but I didn't think others were. I got a deal. I'm Jewish. I got a deal on the room. I've checked my wallet five times since I've been here. Okay, good for you. Uh, I like that what I, what I tried to do was to avoid the noise of the clanging on the table yeah. by encouraging you to put the can of Sprite on the windowsill instead of the table. So what you've gone and done is poured the Sprite into a glass, put oh. the can up on the windowsill, oh, you want this, and you then put it, the yeah. glass back on the table, I oh, I thereby... <laughs> Thereby uh, rending. You know what it was? I thought in my mind, because what I do in my mind a lot is I go to the next step of what I think the person is really saying. So uh -huh. I thought you were trying to avoid me crinkling the can. Ah, no. It yeah. was just the placement on the table. Now we're good. And also I wanted to show off to all the people on the street below that I have Sprite. So I wanted to <laughs> put it in the window. And that, uh, I dated that woman briefly. <laughs> there's, a, there's a billboard of a beautiful and woman. And I don't know. I don't know what, at what age place. that does not uh, uh, still get me excited. <laughs> well, hopefully never. Beforehand, before the show, you were talking about your prostate. Uh, That's true. No, you, I, just yes, because I was you were apologizing for spending a long time in the in the restroom. It wasn't that and, and long. You were saying, it was long no, enough. I didn't think it was until you drew attention to yeah. it, and then I was like, wow, maybe he was in there for a good four minutes instead of two. When you go get older, I'm telling the men out there because it's part of my podcast. Getting older with Andy Kittler, <laughs> uh, your your prostate enlarges. I don't know what a prostate is, and it takes you a little bit longer to pee sometimes. And I've become pee shy as I've gotten older. And this is, and it's not like I was standing in the restroom no. next to you, looking at your penis. You were just pee shy, even not, though the door was closed. Not a, that, not that, not a, not. That's not going to happen again. That's eighties comedy. <laughs> again. <laughs> what kind of comedy were you doing in the eighties, Andy Kent? Like, well, how did you? No, let's go back. So you've driven across the country in your jalopy with uh, with old Mary Sue, who you don't like no more, and she don't like. No, you. I loved her. Oh, she, she just didn't this care for Andy. She didn't care for Andy. Oh, anything. She didn't care for yeah. Mr. Andrew Kimler. I was never w w the one who usually broke up. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. That's so the way it tends to work, isn't it? Because, uh... <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I just feel like it always feels that way. Yeah, it does. Uh, and so then you're, you're playing your guitar at the uh, at the old saloons here in Los Angeles. Yeah, it was terrible, though. And it I doesn't didn't... work. And then how, yeah. how do you stumble into an industry as competitive... And a craft as um, difficult as stand-up. Well, it's only difficult the way I do it, but uh, I make it look hard. <laughs> but when I when, what happened was I was at a, a picnic for people who worked at this. They used to have stereo stores back in the old. You're, you're lucky it's not the '80s because if you would get ripped off by a place I used to work at because there were no prices. So I sold stereos, and we were at a picnic, and I was doing impressions of everybody at the company and my friend Bill said wow you're funny he didn't say that way he goes wow you're funny have you ever thought of doing stand up so I never would have done I maybe would have done it but he encouraged me so I was in a duo for a couple of years and it was one of those things like I think it's kind of a life lesson in the sense that I think a lot of times you don't know if something comes not, I'm not saying easy to, to me but my whole family was funny so I took it for granted I thought everybody was funny mm. so I, did, I didn't quite think of, uh, uh, of that I had never thought of I would be a stand-up comedian, even though I was a fan of stand-up. But so, funny doesn't necessarily translate to, to working as a working stand-up comic. I mean, Billy Connolly, the great Scottish comic, I remember hearing him talking about it and saying that there's a lot of misconceptions about stand-up. Like, everyone, everyone, every every funny guy who's like an office manager... Right. I think this was part of the genius of the conceit of The Office, the original British office yeah. of, with Ricky Gervais's character... Everyone who's who's funny thinks that they're kind of a stand-up, and You're like, right. assume, but doesn't understand that there's a craft to it, there's an art no. to it. It's a discipline. It's a, you know, this is you don't just get up there on stage when you don't feel like it. Yeah. And wing it because you're a wacky guy. Well, that's no question. But if you are truly fun, like there's a lot of people, like Jonathan Winter said, uh, is famous for saying, uh, I don't know who that was. <laughs> it Jonathan sounded Winter. like someone was coming into my someone room. Was coming. Someone was coming into yeah, my yeah. room. And then they realized that it was. Uh, yeah, no shit. Uh, so uh, <laughs> Jonathan Winter said that a lot of people people don't have a sense of humor. They think they do, but they don't. So I think there is that thing where people think that they're funny, but they're not funny. But if you are funny. Truly funny. I would argue that you probably could have a career in some form of comedy, but then you do. There are lots of people who could be funny, but then they don't. They don't want to go through that whole thing 
of and, and maybe they're not meant to do and it. And even if you're funny after three drinks at a party, genuinely right. funny, doesn't mean you're necessarily funny in the late show, at, in the club, on the fourth show of the night, yes. and you're tired and you just want to go home and you right. don't want to be funny. But that, that has to do with that you have the drive. That I feel like I... I would not think of myself as someone who is like a disciplined person because I have ADHD and I'm all over the map, but I have put in my time technique of doing this for over 30 years now, you know, and for the time period every night for forever, you know. So, yeah, you have to put the time in. How did you get the discipline to do that? That was just from uh, I was lucky enough to start during the comedy boom in America when uh, like in the, you know, Letterman and all those guys, uh, Richard Lewis. They caused this real, like, revolution in comedy. And throughout the 80s to the early 90s, there was this secondary comedy boom. And then it got very homogenous and, and kind of messed up. But I was able to take advantage of that. And I came to development during that time period. So I was on the road, like, 40 weeks a year. Wow. For five year For five years. Was there ever a time where you were just based here in Los Angeles, making a living, doing sets at the, at the comedy store and the Laugh Factory and wherever? Or were you always on the road? I started out on the road, and when I came back to town, by that point, the comedy store, the improv, all those things had been more when they were really had the creative juice. And I mean, they, they, they go through changes, and I, sometimes, sometimes the improv is great, sometimes the comedy is great, but there was that time period in the 70s and 80s where uh, they were the places. But when I got off the road, and not off the road, but less off, on the road, which was like the early 90s to mid 90s, that was the alternative scene in Los Angeles. So that was when Mr. Show came out and Janine Garofalo and uh, David Cross and Bob Odenkirk and uh, Kathy Griffin, all those people. And those were like in a club, one place was called Luna Park, mm -hmm. which was on uh, Robertson. And there, and there was a big and tall bookstore that Janine Garofalo uh, had so that was that time period that's where I kind of um, but that happened after the road right uh, uh, and, in other uh, words not the big clubs but the new edgy little places yes. that happened to have a back room where someone right. would get up and do some some I don't know some shtick about Sartre well it wasn't about Sartre but a lot of uh, but a lot of no there was a couple of wee clo bits uh, <laughs> but it was very, very much in reaction. See, I, I wrote an a, a article in National Lampoon, Lampoon called The Hacks Comic Handbook, where I demonstrate how to be a hack comic. And that kind of got me a little bit known amongst comics. And so we were kind of in, we were as a, a protest to mm. the mainstream of the uh, comedians. I can't even think. I mean, it wasn't Dan Cook then, but it would be like uh, Larry. Well, Jay Leno? Well, by that time, Jay Leno was already. Jay Leno was very well, well respected in the 80s. Mm. Then we did make fun of him in the 90s. Yeah, we would make fun of him. But yeah. he wasn't like on the road. On the, I'm trying to think of who the comics were on the road. But even someone like Seinfeld, who was a brilliant comic, but I think he's more brilliant on Seinfeld than he was. If you, if you remember him in the 80s, he was funny, but he kind of like started that movement that then got very unfunny, which right. was why they call it toothpaste. <laughs> You don't glue your teeth. You know. So <laughs> yeah. that's what yeah. we were re reacting to. His of. bit about why is everything on an airplane so small is like the quintessential Seinfeld bit to me because it's one of the it's an observation, but it's completely contentless. Yes, and uh, has a perfectly obvious answer. Right, right, right. <laughs> Things have to be small on a plane because there's not a lot of space because you want planes to be as yeah. efficient as possible. Like he's always ah oh, tiny little peanuts, tiny little why why are they all so small on a plane? Tiny little toilet. Well, what do you want? A fucking huge toilet on a right. plane? Of course, you're going to squeeze in the smallest possible toilet. It, you, it costs a lot of money to fly a plane. Right. So the, the, so you're saying that if you apply too much logic to the <laughs> 80s comedy. But the thing about Jerry Seinfeld, though, was that he was still able to be... Like, he had a joke where he said, uh, you know, sometimes you get a bill in a restaurant and it comes, like, in a folder. You know? Mm -hmm. What is this, the story of the meal? I mean, he was still able to come up with what I would say were, like, maybe generic things, but he did Don't make them wrong. I mean, I think he's brilliant, if only because he d he's so good at whittling down precisely yeah. what it is that he thinks is absurd about the situation into just the right words so that they land in just the right kind of concise, eloquent way. He's, yeah. like, he's like a wordsmith, you know, he's a real craftsman. He is, and also I think the, the, the combination of him and... Because there was an article in The New Yorker about him and Larry David about how they came up with the idea for the show. They were just walking around New York. Yeah. And they would go into these little delis and they mm -hmm. would look like a Korean deli and there would be like a dessert that was unwrapped. And they go, who would buy an unwrapped <laughs> dessert? And that really is the, the thing that's funniest about Seinfeld to me. You know, the thing that Larry David took... Uh, 
to Curb, where he he really m- even more relied on the intersection of different plot points. That's never as funny to me as the uh, hmm. you know the, the the four stories that all interconnect. Yeah, yeah. That never uh, got me as much as the uh, show about nothing. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. I mean, there's a book about that, by the way, that I'm reading called Seinf- just Seinf- came out, right? Yeah, Seinfeldia yeah. or Seinfeldlandia or something like that, which is about the history of the genesis of the whole show and how it all unfolded. It's interesting stuff. Um, your, in terms of the persona and the type of stand-up, your persona, as long as I've been aware of you, has always been injected with a little intentional hack. Right, like yeah. it's like you're, you're you're one step removed from the comedian that you are in terms of you've always got the third eye watching yourself as a performer. Right. So you do you do you'll do intentionally hacky material, or you'll land on a joke very heavily, or you'll make fun of the fact that you're performing in some way. How did that evolve? Was that always the way that you were performing? Well, it did, and then also the, there's a little caveat to that. It's like uh, I'll give you an example of a joke, like I just came up with, which is the joke is um, a lot of critics compare me to Joan Rivers. Uh, not for my comedy, they just predict that I will die during a routine procedure. So, the reason why I give that joke as, as an illustration is that some people think I don't write jokes. You know what mm-hmm, I mean? Right. So I would argue against that. I think that I do write jokes, yep. but there is I do think if you took away my attitude towards it, it wouldn't be me. Mm-hmm. So there is always this little Catskills comic yeah. in my head and it happened from the first time I'd started comedy but I just wasn't developed that well I mean I started out with like Judd Apatow and Paul Feig and we all did these clubs and Judd always tells people like uh, I was the, one of the comics that he always his friends always said that I'll never make it because I was so honest about how poorly I was doing from the beginning but back then it was just like well this isn't going well so I, I developed that <laughs> over the years to the point where it does accompany me, and also I do enjoy things like uh, the next example, the next example, then the kicker. I mean, I do mm, have jokes mm. where I specifically are just showing you the structure of the joke. Right. So I would say that that is what you're saying is true, and and sometimes I see my, I feel myself on stage, like as if I'm a, a old vaudevillian. Yeah. You, know? and, you can and, feel and, it. and making fun of it, and and lo- and loving it, as as uh, Don Adams would say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so back in those days when you're here and uh, you're just part of the alternative comedy scene, I remember the first time that I came to Los Angeles. When I was 18, I took a year off before going to university, at, like many Australians do, and strapped on a backpack and wandered around the world oh, cool. for, for a year. That's my, that's my image of Australians. Yeah, exactly. That's what we all do. It's like, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a rite of passage. Um, and when I landed in LA, I went to the comedy store and I was a huge, you know, Letterman fan and a huge sort of student of American comedy and American talk shows and television. And I remember seeing a guy at the, at the comedy store who was rant, basically his whole set was ranting about how bullshit the Tonight Show is and how he almost made it onto the Tonight Show, but then they didn't want to take him, get him on the Tonight Show and uh, this town is fucked and like uh, you know you think you're so close and then you never quite make it and everyone stabs you and like this was his this was his material and I walked out as an 18 year old thinking I mean how on earth how brutal right this industry must be in comparison yeah. to anything that I'd ever encountered or was aspiring to encounter even in a medium-sized market like Australia that this is a, a city which is and I've always felt that. It's so opaque, uh, Hollywood, and so is broadcasting in, in New York. When you're on the outside of it, it's almost impossible to get in. And then once you're on the inside of it, it's almost impossible to navigate. Yeah. And the idea of ending up being on The Tonight Show or on Letterman or something like that, it just seems like it's so very close but so far. You can drive past the studio, but you can never get through the doors. This is all a long-winded way of of sort of saying what was the path to you finally getting through that door and being on Letterman, and what was that experience like? Well, you know what you're saying is so interesting to me because it's dizzying. Like we're right a half block. We are from... li- yeah, we are literally overlooking. I mean, I'm looking at downtown LA from a, a hotel room right next door to the to the comedy store. And as I, uh, no matter how old I am or whatever I, whenever I go by there, I get sick to my stomach because I never. 
uh, the comedy store was I never really played it that much and uh, early on like uh, I remember uh, them saying well Mitzi says you can work the door or something and for some reason in my Mitzi was, is the uh, legend who runs the right who and, ran and some people did like ran the door or they park car for some reason that was the one thing I wasn't willing to it sounded weird to me and I think my instincts were right so uh, but she was going to throw you a bone and be like yeah, what? you can like take the tickets at the door right, in, it, in exchange for maybe eventually getting stage time or something and, and I did that and also, like the Laugh Factory, would have a thing where you'd line up for twelve hours. There's certain things I wouldn't do. I would, I put my thing in a hat if it was. But just the idea of my family doesn't like lines, and <laughs> my, and I don't like the idea that I'm going to be the doorman and then on the way to. I mean, I don't mind being a doorman as a job, but being part of that family type thing. So um, that was always very uh, off-putting to me, but scary. Just like, and and when you think about it. Uh, when I used to go in the improv, even which I became more of a regular, it, was, it scared it scared the life out of me. But there's something very egalitarian about stand up because when you do start, and people, I would have had to have moved. It's such a weird thing. Like people say, "Oh, you started in L.A." Well, I would have had to have moved out of L.A. to go to a small city because I came here to be a musician. Right. So when I started comedy, I wouldn't have thought, "Well, I better go to a small city." I started here, but this place is huge. So I started like at a uh, dinner theater type of Italian restaurant in Lomita, California. So when you start, there's all, and if anyone moved to LA tomorrow, you would, and, and if that was your dream to do stand up, I think it's a, a more realistic way in. Uh, than doing anything else. I feel very lucky. Well, sure, you can't start in Dubuque, right? Or you, Tucson. I mean, you have to be in New York or LA, maybe Boston, San Francisco, but right. you've got to be in a, or Chicago, maybe you've got to be in a big city. But if I, was, for example, was just going out as an actor, I think it would be very, it would be exponentially more difficult oh, for I see. me. Yeah. So I always feel very lucky that I was a stand-up because, look, you know, next year I could be broke. Mm. Uh, and when 2008 came and... Uh, we had the strike and the recession. We were all broke. But uh, the fact that I can go out and still uh, people, will, not that I'm a huge draw, but I can make a living mm. performing, I feel I have a little bit of a thing to fall back on. Which well, you've is got your fun. fan base now that when you go to a town, presumably they will come out. Sometimes. It's still weird. It's really? still weird. Well, so, I mean, uh, they will. It's like, you know, like Twitter. That's my thing. I'm on Twitter too much. I'm addicted to it. So, like, if I say I'm coming to Schmeckletown, well then, if you're not reading Twitter right, then it just yeah. goes down the line. So there's no there's no perfect thing. But I don't want to cry poor, or or um, but I'm I, and I do do well sometimes. But it's it's not like a, a Brian Regan or Jim Gaffigan or you know there are certain <laughs> comic. And I've asked Jim Gaffigan about it. Like if you ask him about it, I don't know if you've interviewed him, but he says like oh, he man. can't even trace what broke it for him. It was like a couple a few Comedy Central specials, a few Conans, and then all of a sudden it went to another level yeah. i haven't been to that level but i am i'm very happy and i can you know and i can go with the clubs all the time. yeah and so so so, we, so talk about that so you get to you're you make it to a position at which you're able to make a living right here uh and i guess the thing about stand-up also is you can do stand-up regardless of whether or not someone pays you to do it unlike acting in exactly, words, right? I exactly. Mean, an actor comes here and just has to spend endless hours by the phone quetching about whether or not they're going to get a call from their agent whereas if you're a stand-up at least you can go out every night and you can get somewhere you can do stand-up even right. if it's unpaid um, so at least you can hone your, your craft but um, yeah so talk to us about Letterman um, what what happens to <clears throat> that you managed to get on the late show well it just happens to be that that was the gen I grew up in the generation like I'm watching the old Johnny Carson's now and this great to watch him. and of course I was around when he was around but I started by the time I started he was starting to wrap up and so Letterman was my hero you know I was really I loved people who uh, made fun to me Letterman was like a, Carson did it too uh, and and Richard Pryor did it, and but but like I, I loved how Letterman would sell out a bit, you know, and that to me is like explain uh, what that means. That means like uh, right in the middle of the bit's not going well, he's not going, he's not going to pretend it's going well. He's going to call attention to the fact that it's either a bad bit or he's not doing the bit well. And to me, that's truly subversive, because a lot of people try to be subversive. The, when, like when Letterman went, and I think GE bought uh, NBC. And Letterman tried to go with the with the flowers over there, and they wouldn't let him into the building. That to me is subversive. Is that he's always like kind of like 
biting the hand that feeds him mm. type thing. He'd so, always talk about the network nincompoops and he'd, yeah, he'd and make fun cur- of his employers. And be, a, and be a curmudgeon. And I yeah. love that part of it, which is what L- Leno, who was at his best when he was on Letterman in the 80s, when he got this weird dream in his head that he had to be the Tonight Show guy, which was crazy because he has no interest in any topics uh, other than cars. Uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, so Letterman was always the game for me, and I just wanted to be in that show so badly, and um, just try for years and years. And I think I don't remember Robert Moore, when Robert Morton was there. Finally, when Zoe Friedman, who's uh, Bud Friedman's daughter and uh, a, good, a good friend of mine, she was booking. The uh, she was booking comics and she got me my spot, and it was 1996 and I was like so nervous and uh, it didn't go well uh, as far as I was concerned. I just you know I don't know you know how like Roseanne did the Tonight Show and it went amazing. That happens, but for me I I wonder how many fit into my category where it's your dream show and you're just kind of nervous and it was okay and then I didn't go on for like four years and then uh, in 2000 I went on. And I said, my line, I said, like, uh, I was on the show uh, four years ago, and I'm on tonight. I just want to say I can't live on this kind of money. <laughs> and uh, and that that went well, and then a few more started to go well. And then 2005, <laughs> in 2005, I did. Like, you've been doing nothing yeah, for just years, right. four years. Yeah. And in 2005, I had one of these things where the, the, the set went really great, and the audience liked it. And then because he wanted me... He used to go out and do field pieces, but he, then he would get mobbed. You couldn't do them anymore. Yeah. And so he, they were looking for someone to do them. And they had Rupert G, but Rupert was doing stuff. But he was doing that thing where he uh, had the camera on his head. <laughs> And he would say anything Dave wanted him to say. Yeah, right. And he almost got beat up a couple of times. For people who don't know, he would have a camera in. He would have a camera on his on, his, on a hat. Yeah. And an earpiece in his ear. Right. And he would essentially be a puppet. This is the this is the owner of the Hello Deli, which was the delicatessen next door to the to David Dave Letterman's theatre. And uh, he'd go out and he'd do he'd do field pieces for for Dave. But and he, right, like, you're saying he, yeah, he, he almost got he, he, yeah, almost couple, got beaten up. Yeah, almost got beaten up because Dave was having so much fun. He's in the van. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. So then I started to do these things. I did like thirty nine of them. Wow. Uh, different pieces like and so it really was a dream come true. And uh, the the funniest thing to me was when I was at the toy fair. It, well, it was almost de- almost got killed in a way. I I, I was uh, operating a pogo stick at the toy fair. And I, I, I flew off of it onto my back on a cement floor. Wow. And it was really like I almost broke my back. And then every time I go on the show, Letterman and said, you have to sue us. You must sue us. <laughs> he was so funny <laughs> encouraging me to sue. I think part of, uh, I wonder if part of the uh, the appeal and the reason why he got a kick out of you was, you were just mentioning how he was sort of, always detached from the comedy and detached from the show that he was you know he would make fun of the bit that he was doing yeah he would make fun of his employers and so on and he was really sort of for people who aren't students of late night i mean what letterman did was sort of do the anti talk show in yes. a way right i mean he really did a, a talk show that was self-referential and that was looking back on itself and was mocking tv at the same time as it was doing tv back when he was doing the original show on on nbc you know, right. doing a, putting a, strapping a, a camera to the head of a monkey and having it run around the studio and with monkey cam flashing up on the screen in gigantic red letters. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and the Velcro thing. And the, and the, you know, he'd yeah. dress himself up in a Velcro suit and take a running jump and launch himself at a Velcro wall and see how high he could he could reach. So all that sort of stuff. I wonder whether part of the, the appeal of you was what I was saying earlier about you being sort of a self-referential, sticky, bush belt kind of Catskills comic, yeah, yeah, is this, is similar towards stand-up? Yeah, it's I a think similar you're... sensibility as Dave's sensibility towards TV. I would like to think it is, and I also think, and what I also would do all the time uh, when I would put my sets together was I would make sure that I uh, think about bit jokes that he would like me to do, mm. and so uh, I did that all the time. So I would come up. Sometimes it would be things that wouldn't even be like it's not just to go for an obscure reference but i was always trying to make him laugh um and, and also paul Schaefer laugh too <laughs> but yeah i really do i mean i really do feel it's the same we're in the same vein and when you do a set on on letterman and i mean 96 so it's interesting to hear you say that that didn't go so well i mean that was sort of the that was really letterman's peak i guess the the early 90s that was when he was still probably beating jay leno and it was the, he was the biggest game in town when you walk off set what did that feel like well 
it, it's if you were like in a, like if you're in a, a Letterman fanatic like I am, there's different time period. I actually think the time period. Uh, well, when he first got the show, it was just amazing. Ninety two. Yeah, and it was amazing, 94. and he yeah. was winning in the ring. Yeah. But then there was a time period where he didn't seem as as happy. Where it seemed like the theater was too big. I, I have a theory about this that the reason why that old the, the theater that Seth uh, Myers is in now there's something magical about that uh, studio. It's very intimate. Mm. After his heart attack, and just to clarify for listeners, that's where Conan was before Seth, and that's where Letterman was before Conan. That's right. where that late night slot on NBC, that twelve thirty to one thirty in the morning slot, has been a kind of a hotbed of in- innovation for the past thirty years. And that's that's at Rockefeller Center, whereas Letterman is in a gigantic Broadway theater up the road. Exactly. And so after his heart attack, I feel like he let a lot of stuff go between him and Leno. So I really feel like that was the golden age of that show. Was I mean, yes, I also was doing field pieces then too. Mm-hmm. But I feel like the, the, uh, the 2000s were when he was, you know, because the, when the history books are written or whatever, they're not going to say, oh, well, the ratings were this. They're not no, gonna, sure. They're just going to say this guy was the was the guy. Mm, and mm. Uh, so um, I felt like that was really... Um, the, But, you know, that's a whole other life from the 80s because that was, you know... Yeah. You know, so he's had many incarnations. Uh, and I wasn't around for that. But I was so... Inf- when Richard Lewis would go on uh, Letterman, I just was, like, glued. And, and that's the thing, too. I always had a, a deference. Like, one time... I never got to talk to Dave much because uh, the only time I could talk to him was really when we would show a field piece mm-hmm. and then we would talk in between because once I was done, I'd leave. I'd never stay through a commercial. But one time I said to him, uh, I said, so how are you doing? He goes, I could drop dead at any minute. <laughs> so, he, But I always felt like the way he talks about Johnny Carson is the way I feel about him. Absolutely. I don't like... I couldn't talk to him like Bill Murray talks to him. Mm, or mm, I always mm. felt like there was a, a there had to be that deference. Yeah. You know? So did you ever do a set, uh, a stand up set on his show, and then go to the couch after the set? A couple of times. And the other interesting thing about that is, he was very whatever he wanted me to do, I did. Like he didn't even say to do it. But for example, he doesn't say you should wear a jacket. But I knew that he wanted people to wear a jacket, so I always wore a suit jacket on it. Also, he doesn't like. Um, when you use cue cards, this is just stuff I had heard. He mm-hmm. never said anything. So, and I have a problem where I lose my I, I, my mind goes blank. I never use cue cards. And then he instituted a thing that John used to do, where he didn't want you to use a microphone. And everybody was very upset with it at first. Not upset, but nervous about it. And I loved it. I everything that he that he did made sense to me because it doesn't really look like a nightclub. Mm. It looks different. Yeah. And so also uh, why is this person holding a microphone when they're on a studio set where which is right. mic'd by professionals? It's, it's sort of weird, right? I mean there are sort of audio weird. professionals here who are, who can mic this place. And it doesn't look like a nightclub. So mm. so I really got into all those different things and having done maybe 12 or 15 stand I forget how many the last two sets I did I think were the best things I've ever done personally Mm. because I think the hardest thing to do unless you're like Stephen Wright or Mitch Hedberg or a certain kind of comic it's very hard to do short sets they're very difficult yeah and it took me that long and the last two was almost like this feeling like I had no sense of time I was in the moment I was slow I wasn't like speeding up Mm. this is the best feeling best feeling in the the world amazing I've heard Letterman talk about doing his sets on on Johnny's show on Johnny's show <laughs> on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. I know, Carson. I know what you mean. <laughs> I, 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 I just you. feel like I'm I'm that pretentious guy who's speaking about <laughs> Johnny Carson as if we used to go and get martinis together, uh, and how he would he would he would you do your set and then you would pause and yes. if Johnny would look at you and beckon you over, then that meant you had nailed it and you would come and sit down and you'd, he'd talk to you and that was sort of this weird sort of uh, I guess. Ritual that, right. that everybody who ever did the show was sort of looking for, whether or not Johnny would get it, would invite them to the desk or not, or whether or not that he'd let you go back out. Um, did Letterman do that? No. And the thing is, when I look back, I don't know if you, like I said, I've been watching these Johnny Carsons on like, it's called Me TV or Antenna TV. I'd love to and, see it. Uh, yeah, they're on like every night at 11 uh-huh. o'clock. And you see how how nerve wracking it is because the comic's afraid to look over. Mm-hmm. Dave didn't do that. He would if we had ex- a couple times we had extra time on the show when he had me sit down. But what he does is he walks over. 
for right, every comic, right. and it's the most. Uh, mm. It's great. <laughs> you're still you're still kind of uh, looking uh, behind you, but yeah, I mean, I can't imagine. I think it made total sense the way Johnny was doing it because he wanted to Johnny. I'm saying because <laughs> he Lester, wanted to JC, yeah, JC, because he wanted to have that. You know, he sometimes didn't want to invite you over, but it must have been terrible. You know, yeah, okay. uh, and so the last episode of Letterman, when you're talking about what the highlights of that show were and when his greatest sort of uh, period was. The final episode, I sat there watching it. I actually subscribed. I, I had I had cut my cable uh, subscription. Oh wow! Uh, just so that I could, you know, because I mean, who wants to pay one hundred and thirty bucks a month just to get channels that you never watch? But not a sports fan, that means. Not a sports fan. Yeah. Not an American <laughs> sports fan, at least. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, so I subscribed to, like, CBS.com streaming, uh, you know, monthly service just so that I could watch the last episode live. And a lot of that stuff just took me right back because it was a highlights show, essentially, yeah. of a lot of stuff, I think, from the early 90s, which makes me right and you wrong about the highlight day, about the time when Letterman was best because uh, that was it was him going, him in the drive through like, uh, you know, operating a drive through at a fast food Yeah, is that the 80s, though, or is that the 90s? No, that's 90s. No, that's it hilarious. Because it was all from CBS because it was all oh, well, that is hilarious. Right? The drive through is 92, 93, is 94. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm wrong. Then. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, lo- I loved that. And... As the as it was coming, I remember actually reading in uh, an interview with Letterman somewhere, talking about how when he was watching the last episode of Carson, that Carson ever did it, he sort of felt like his life was kind of slipping away, and like yeah, this was, yeah. it was coming towards the end of like you right. know, it was like watching a friend die in a way. And in a small way, I sort of felt that about about Letterman's final show. I mean, it, it really brought tears to my eyes. Were you watching that live? Well, it was one of these things where I get a call from the East Coast because uh, my brother, I didn't know, but I, I was in the montage. There's a final montage that uh, they put together. It did, they did an amazing... Uh, uh, Barbara Gaines and um, the producers put an amazing package of just like all these people on the show mm-hmm. and I'm in that package. So I got that call from the East Coast so I was just thrilled about that. Mm. Um, and, and you're saying that because the East Coast airs at three hours earlier right, than the right. West Coast because of the time difference. So to me, and then of course, you know, to me it looks like I'm in that clip for an hour. You know, it's only a second or two. <laughs> but it seems like, oh, I think they held even longer on me. So <laughs> that was a total thrill. But it really it really was like, you know, I, I, I had recorded and I still have um, uh, the wife and I, we have the 10, 10 from the last couple of months mm-hmm. we still haven't seen yet. So it was extremely painful for me because um, I heard, you know, Dave is like very hard on himself, like extremely hard on himself, uh, even harder on himself. I, I think I'm hard on myself, but I think he's very. So I think when he first said that he wanted to leave, I think he immediately felt like he didn't want to leave after that. So he, so I think, but then I think that he, the fact that he has a son. It, I think ultimately he did want to spend these years yeah. with with Harry, but yeah, it was just it's it terribly sad to me. I'm still not over it because to me it was like my life uh, and the tradition of it of just the, the, which I still think I'm looking for in general in in TV in general whether it's like Mar- Mary Tyler Moore or All in the Family or I think we're still looking for that shared experience of that we all watch this thing. And I think it's harder now, even though there's so many different places to have great shows, and there are great shows. But I think I'm always looking for that thing where this, per- like after 9/11, when Dave came on, mm. you feel like you were able to process the grief through him. And I think that's like a I don't know where that comes from, but there's some kind of a root thing in us. Yeah, I think he. I mean, it may turn out that he was the last person who was that sort of the last person who everybody. Well, I suppose people were watching Jay Leno, and I suppose John Stewart was influential in the two thousands. But it's not. It's not. It's the all same, changed now. It's in changed. A way. I mean, it's weird. No one that, that that communal shared experience that you're talking about, where you know, in the in the sixties or seventies or whatever, everybody would everybody had watched Walter Cronkite, and everybody had watched the Mary Tyler Moore show. Right. Like, yeah. You didn't have to. It was just assumed at work that you know, of course, that person would you know, your all of your colleagues would have seen the same thing. And now, there were water coolers. There were water coolers. <laughs> literal and, and literal people, water coolers. We gather around. <laughs> no, I think it's really true. And I'm sure there's always going to be... There, It's like, I do believe like the more things change, the more they stay the same. So I think there's always different ways of getting that feeling. But it's definitely uh, uh, not the same. Mm. You know. How do you think Stephen Colbert is doing? 
Well, I'm a huge, I was a huge fan of Stephen Colbert. I, 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 you know, like to me that character he did was the great. I don't think there's anybody funnier than him. Um, I find that I don't watch things as much. I, I don't watch his show as much, even though I love him. I just don't watch it. When I watch it, I love it, but I'm not, you know, I'm not drawn to watch it every night. So I don't know. I think he's in a... And also, I hear this pressure on him uh, at CBS. I don't think that's ever good. It's a weird, yeah. It's a bit of a weird show. He needs to find his, his stride. The, I'm not, the band's weird to me. <laughs> the uh, the uh, yeah. The guy. Uh, the, whole, the whole the whole the thing, keyboard where quite, you hold it or you blow on the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> but to me, he's like. I think there's no funnier like physical comedian than him when he gets into these things where he's dancing or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I, I I just think he's great. But... I hope it'll work. I love I loved his old show. Yeah. Um, it, one one episode of this uh, of this season of We the People Live that uh, that I'm doing while I'm out here is with Sam Harris the uh, the. The singer? Atheist slash... <laughs> slash yeah, I know. Ph- the, sing- the singer guy and, uh, actually blocked me. I didn't know that was say, a singer called Oh, Sam yes. He's a very famous <laughs> singer because he won the first Star Search. Is that, does that name, make you very famous? It made him famous at the time. He's not necessarily famous now. Okay. But when I was yelling at Sam Harris, the atheist... Yeah, once, you were accidentally yelling I at him. accidentally... Uh, and to me, it was like... He blocked me immediately, but I was like, I would have thought at one point he would, he he would, would say, say Dude, I'm not, not talking me. about Muslims. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, so there's an episode, of, I'm not sure exactly what order these will be released in, but there's like a three and a half hour uh, episode with, with me and Joe Rogan and Hannibal Burris and Sam Harris. Uh, and all together? All together. Wow. Yeah, all together. It's a, that's a, it's a real corker. Um, but uh, it's funny that I'm doing that in the same week that I'm doing this episode with you because yeah. I sometimes spy on your uh, your like Twitter feuds right. with, uh, with Sam Sam Harris. What's going on there? What's your What's your relationship to to faith and well, my that's my being re- pinged there? yeah. I mean, I'm really angry about. I mean, it's like I'm I, I'm not even a, like you know people who say like well we'll go you know not that he would invite me or anything. I have no desire to debate him or Bill Maher or any of these guys. I really feel like. Uh, you know, I, I do a joke in my act that uh, when I, you know, to me, atheists. My memory of atheists were just like uh, people who looked very depressed at picnics, you know. <laughs> and my dad was an, an agnostic, leaning towards atheism. And when I would tell him about the new atheists, he was shocked by how horrible. It's like, for example, I was raised Jewish, which means like for the most part, you're not that uh, spiritual. But when I was 16, my mother became a Quaker. And the Quaker is a wonderful religion. Uh, my mother doesn't necessarily believe in God. She doesn't know, but she relates to how she gets together. They're pacifists. And it's like this whole idea that you're just going to uh, put people down. I was raised like, as long as someone's not trying to bother you, you should respect, you know, why are you hate what they're doing? And I just think that for whatever reason, I think atheism at its best, there's nothing scientific about it. We don't know what's going to happen when we die. Nobody knows. There's no, there's no science involved in saying, well, I see, I see a person die and I don't see them afterwards, so I know that there's nothing. We don't know what there is afterwards. My spirituality is in the moment. It's like how I feel from music, how I feel from comedy, how I feel from taking acid in college. It's like there's a part of I like the, that you added in college. Thing. College. Right. College. I'm still going to college <laughs> just for acid. <laughs> and, and I you, enrolled at UCLA just and you, so I could get the acid. Right, and you have this moment where you feel it's transcendent. I don't, I'm not trying to prove that it's something. I'm not anti-evolution. Mm. Uh, but years ago, I predicted that this would go badly, and it has gone badly. There's, that what would? Well, if you go online, you'll see the Trump people. They're the same as the Sam Harris people. They're the meanest, most nasty people in the world. They not only are saying they are anti-theist, they are. They will mock well, you. Trump people aren't. Trump people are. And no, so are. Tr- I said Trump people are not. I mean, Trump people are religious. Uh, some mostly. of them are, but some of them are uh, anti-Muslim in the same way. Right. They're anti-Muslim. But they're religious. Be- I mean, they're like the pastor who wanted to. No, no, the not Quran. yet. They're, they're you're like, right, but they, but they hate Muslims the same yes. way. There's a but crossover. No, I think Sam hates. He, he claims not to, but he's he's part of a movement that. Does. Here would be the difference. I think. Um, is it possible to be a, to be an atheist towards formal religions and their historical and cosmic claims, but an agnostic ab- about 
the possibility of there being some vast ineffable purpose to the universe and experience and transcendent experiences, right? Because I mean, Sam's a neuro. I'm not going to speak about he's Sam. A he's a neuroscientist. He's a neuroscientist. He can speak for himself. But from my perspective, as a secular Jew and essentially an atheist Jew, I I am agnostic towards. And I and as someone who's who's experienced incredible transcendent experiences on acid and other and like ayahuasca and other things as yes, well. Yes, right. I am. I think the existence of consciousness is deeply spooky and incredible, and yeah. the the fact of the existence of the cosmos at all is amazing. How atoms from stars have assembled themselves into being self aware creatures having a conversation around a a Zoom handy recorder H four N. Right. That we managed to invent is extraordinary. Yeah. And mystifying. And science can't fundamentally answer the question of why the whole shebang exists in the first place. Right. But it can also be true that all of the historical claims about what went down 2,000 years ago in the Middle East and whether or not a particular person was a virgin or not and whether or not someone went you know, right, went to heaven after three days, three days after dying, or whether or not Muhammad flew to heaven on a winged horse, or whether or not Moses parted the Red Sea, you can, you can quite confidently say that there's no good reason to believe in any of that. Right. There's just no, you know, yeah. using the normal standards of evidence that we would require in order to know whether or not the Holocaust happened or whether or not the Napoleonic Wars happened. Right. There's just no good reason to think that these books are anything other than just fictional books that were written by men. Right, but that, but my point then is... That, that means that you're an atheist towards well, no, formal religion. Towards formal religion, but to me that's like, yeah, I, I, I figured that out when I was 10. You know what I'm saying? It's like <laughs> but I, I'm against fundamental. Well, it. but they do. So what? So it's like I'm not. If, if 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 people like Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins, if they really cared about that, they would be focusing on the Texas school bo- school board. That's where you want to focus on people who are still well, they trying. Do. They, they do, do but for the most part, my, that's not what my mother believes. That's not what people I know mostly believe. I'm against fundamentalism of all kinds, and but but they're fundamentalists too. I don't. I, I couldn't care less what, uh, what a neuroscience, a white neuroscientist guy who, to me, has a, a, has anger against people for their religion. No matter what he says, the, the sum total of him and Marr and Dawkins and Hitchens, they hate Muslims, and that's the. They may say they don't, and but how do you know? I've read it. I've read them. Uh, you know, just uh, when I hear Sam Harris say uh, Islam is the mother load of bad ideas. How do, why would I trust him? He's not a religious scholar. I mean, if you want to go to Reza S. Aslan or people have actually studied religion, yeah. So I'm saying, yeah, of course, I don't believe in that God is, uh, like, you know, like Ricky Gervais thinks he's a genius because he figured out God's not an old man who lived in the clouds. <laughs> this, is, this is fundamentalism 101. This is something that you go through when you're a kid. And so it's like, who would argue that those things are true? But most well, people, of, I think you're. Giving, well, then they're wrong. The I people are giving, arguing they're wrong. I think the the earth is not flat. I think flat. you're giving too much credit to most to the average religious person who would like my grandmother. Well, not my grandmother, but my grandmother-in-law, for example, uh, whilst not a religious fundamentalist who's going to fly planes into buildings, yeah, would not concede that Jesus was not divine. Well, but I mean, that's I'm not for her. But the the, the Dalai Lama doesn't say that. I mean, Buddhist, you know, Zen no, Buddhists Buddhist don't say don't, that. But Sam Harris doesn't spend a lot of time criticizing well, because, Buddhism. But he, but the the net result is that there's more hate crimes towards Muslims, and those people are causing it. I, you know, the the argument that you can't criticize, it's never that anybody like me has said you can't criticize. That's what's so ironic about it to me that I would be defending religion. To me, it's like the hackiest thing in the world when comedians do atheist material. It's like, oh yeah, let me get this straight. I used to do a joke where they go, I, w- I hope God is an old man who lives in the clouds because when the atheist gets up there, he goes, oh, you're surprised, hot shot? I mean, this is like, it's almost hacky to me to have this discussion about whether uh, Jesus really existed or whatever it was. I'm, I'm way, way past that. I'm mm. way, way past that. And, and, and to the extent that there are fundamentalists who believe the earth is flat or they don't believe in evolution, I'm sorry that they feel that way. But for the most part, I think what I know from being online is that I have a lot of Muslim friends. They're very sophisticated people. And they, all they feel is hate. And all they feel is that they're going to be rounded up. And, and that's what Trump's doing. And I see nothing good what Bill Maher and Richard Dawkins... I see nothing good about what they're doing. I mean, wh- one of the one of the concerns that, uh, that that some people in the atheist movement have about Donald Trump is that he's partly fueled by by the 
inability of well-meaning people on the left to speak honestly but not in a bigoted way about the problem of Islamic theocracy, of Islamic conservatism, the illiberalism of, of Islam, that because we because people feel like they're treading on eggshells all the time. It You're kind doing of, it, it there's, a Dave in, Rubin, there's a Dave Rubin, it, there's a regressive left uh, argument. Uh, sort of. I mean, it, Dave's, uh, Dave's, you know, doesn't make it as, as well as one might, I don't think. But, um, yeah, the, 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 it's, the Trump is a sort of a pressure release valve, in a way, for, for people who feel like there's, like if you're a low information voter in yeah. the south of France and you see that every time someone every time there's some kind of a terrorist attack the person who's committing it is screaming Allah Akbar right but every single person on the left is saying there's no problem with Islam uh, you know th- th- it has nothing to do with Islam and the only pe- person you can vote for is the National Front and the fascists yeah then but that's not the way you, yeah but who, the, do you, but who do you back but, like we need to carve out a space where we can talk but those Talk white people, it. those people, the reason why I'm sensitive to it is the same people who are arguing with, I think, unknowingly people like Sam Harris are arguing for, it's exactly like Germany in the 30s. Where do you think these right-wing movements came from? They didn't come from, Hitler didn't come from because people were too progressive about Jews. He came from deep-seated no, the, hate. So no, but he also didn't come from like a, a, a rational, secular analysis of what the problems facing Germany was and like... Yeah, right, but I, mean, I just think it's very simplistic to think. It's like, if, uh, I can't even talk about, like, if you hear something like Re- Reza, I'm, I don't know what yeah, like, yeah, but he'll yeah. talk about, like, when they say, like, uh, things that are Islam-based. He goes, no, well, that's Africa-based. That's like all these countries in Africa do this. I think it's in like... In terms of, like, female genital mutilation and stuff Yeah, like it's that. like, for example, I mean, do, do we not listen to the Beatles? I mean, do we, do we go Helter Skelter is wrong because Charles Manson used Helter Skelter? I think all of the people who are evil pervert real things. And so I don't focus... To me, it's not that important that they perverted Islam... Because then you're saying, well, what, like, we're not supposed to worry about the white nationalists. That's what Bill Maher says. Never worry again. Like, do you think? I don't even think Bill Maher knows that there's that guy, Brevik, in Norway. I really don't and think he Brevik. knows him. Yeah, yeah, I don't think he knows him. Uh, it's like well, he's probably aware of the news. Maybe, event. but he <laughs> makes his <laughs> argument. The only thing we have to worry about is, is Islamic and, terrorism. It's crazy to me. We have I to worry about. I think he thinks that it's more likely that there's going to be an act of me- mega terrorism by jihadists than by a white supremacist. I just think it's all perversions of. I just think focus on the people doing it, and 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 we know how they always say Obama doesn't want to say radical Islam. That's just politics. That's right with. Yeah, politics. of course. I think that's a red herring. I mean, he's the yeah. president of the United States. He has to be careful what he says. <laughs> you know, exactly. <laughs> he's, so, got, he's got obligations to other parties, to other states, to other leaders, to other. You know, the the. the there's a certain there's a certain way that one conducts foreign diplomacy that it, that can't be dictated by Donald Trump. The problem but, is that these people, I hate them and they hate me. So there's no like like Sam Harris, I hate I hate him and I hate Richard Dawkins and I hate Bill Maher. There's no going back for me. It's right. like and they hate me. Like with Sam Harris, like he thinks like one <laughs> one time I said I'm reporting Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins to uh, the Southern Poverty Law thing as a hate group. And he's like, well, good luck with that. I mean, he doesn't I don't think he realizes that I'm that you're a comedian. That comedian. You know? so <laughs> I'll put like, it out to him next yeah, time. Yeah, put it out to him. I talk to him. Yeah. Uh, it, it, Ooh, let's I wrap up. Stepped on your drink. Don't don't step on my <laughs> drink. <laughs> <laughs> That's rule number one. I, I don't uh, discount what you're saying about things. That I've never discounted that fundamentalism is bad. It's just I don't think that's the issue overriding issue right now right um point uh, wrap us up with advice uh, from the old uh, wise and dandy kindler to young, <laughs> to young people starting out in uh, in in comedy uh where do you think the uh, the industry is at what do you make of all the changes going on in broadcasting what would you do if you were 18 again if i was 18 again i would be uh, i i give this advice a lot but uh, i wish i'd taken it and i wish people would take it is to not be hard on yourself because i just was so hard on myself I think it's an amazing uh, environment now. I don't think there's ever been a better time to be a stand-up comedian. You know, when I started, people couldn't say, you know, Ellen couldn't say she was gay. Uh, people, um, but I think... Ellen's gay? <laughs> Sorry, that was too easy. <laughs> I like it. You know what, though? Your performance level is excellent. Uh, so I think it's very... Um, I think the main lesson that people don't learn, and I, and I never kind of had this, people are, stay in their head about everything so in other words they go how do you be a stand-up comic and they just stay in their head they don't realize that if you want to do it you have to do it right you know you can't just 
uh, try to figure out the system. And so many people, when they start in any creative field, they forgot what got them into the thing, which was like just kidding around as a kid and having fun. And they get too into their head about how's it going to happen. I think there is like a spiritual side to things. Like if you just get a thing going, there's an energy to that and things start to take care of themselves. And I think LA is a perfect place. I love it because like people come from all over the world here. So I always feel there's opportunity here. And uh, so I recommend people when they're 18, they come right here, look me up. And uh, especially if they are, I have a hostel. Beautiful young women. <laughs> they you can stay very, with me. You said that very Jewish like. <laughs> beautiful young women. You're a beautiful young lady. <laughs> lady. <laughs> Andy, uh, it's a great honor and, uh, this, and privilege to talk to you. This was fantastic. Thank you Thank for being you for on uh, With the People Live. Stay tuned for more episodes next week. Uh, follow us at WTP underscore live. Where do people follow you, Andy? Uh, on the Mostly old twi- on the old Andy tweet. Kindler. Mostly at, at Andy Kindler. Make debate healthy again, humans. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>